Welcome to Private Equity Profits. Clifford Locks is a certified board of director, a trusted confidant to CEOs, C-level exec, and high potential employees to help them clarify goals, unlock their potential, and create actionable strategic plans. Seth Green is the nation's foremost authority on growing your portfolio companies with direct response marketing. He is the founder of the direct response marketing firm, Market Domination LLC, and he is an eight-time best-selling author who has been interviewed on NBC, CBS, Forbes Inc., CBS Money Watch, and many more. Cliff and Seth interview top players in the financial sector, focusing on private equity firms, venture capital companies, and family offices, discussing developments and trends shaping the industry. These experts will share with you how they've grown their businesses and increased profit, and how you can too. And now, here's your host, Cliff Locks. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Private Equity Profits Podcast. I'm Cliff Locks, your host. Today's guest is Michael Episcope, the co-CEO of Origin Investments, a real estate investment firm that helps high net worth investor family offices and registered investment advisors grow and preserve wealth by providing best-in-class real estate solutions. Origin Investment is a private real estate manager that builds and buys and lends to multifamily real estate projects in the fast-growing markets throughout the U.S. Since their founding in 2007, they have executed more than $2.5 billion in real estate transactions, and its principals have invested alongside their investors $60 million. Michael co-chairs the investment committee and oversees the investor relations marketing and the company operations. Michael brings 25 years of investment and risk management experience to the company and believes that calculated risk-taking in inefficient markets is the key to building wealth. Michael, thanks for being on the show today. Thanks for having me, Cliff. It's a privilege. Tell us about your background and how you ended up in real estate. Uh, I'll, t- I'll take you back, I guess, a little bit of ways to um, the early days when I first got introduced to real estate. My, my grandfather was uh, in real estate when I was, he was in it when I was very young. And then I started working summer jobs with him when I was about 12, 13, 14. Mm-hmm. And he managed a really rough uh, set of properties on the west side of Chicago, bought things in the 1970s out of the tax sales and things like that. And that's when people were really giving back the keys to these buildings. So he really understood the, the nuts and bolts, the nitty gritty. And I, I, I really look back as sort of a, you know, kind of a foundational point in my career and, you know, just tell, working with him in the summers and seeing what it afforded him uh, in his career. I left, obviously went, um, you know, high school, uh, worked a little bit with him and stuff. But after college or really during college, I started my first career and it had nothing to do with real estate. It was in commodities trading. And that was when I was about 19 years old. And I was between my freshman and sophomore year of college. I ended up getting a summer job. I loved it down at the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. And I stayed down there and I worked as a clerk, essentially, for five, six, seven years, working my way up. I was a broker, got an opportunity to trade on the floors. I started in January 1st of 1997. I remember walking into the pits. I had a broken shoulder. I had a snowboarding accident like three weeks prior. So I was in the pits and, you know, trying to fend people off. And I was on painkillers and everything. And, you know, it's a tough way to start a career, but it worked out. And, um, you know, I did that for about nine years. And I always tell people in the beginning, I was single and I didn't have any money. So there was really nothing that I was risking. I could always replace the salary that I gave up. So I wanted to go for it and bet on myself. And I did. And it worked out really well. And at the end, nine years later, computers started coming into the business. The risk reward started to change. We lost our our edge as floor traders. There was asymmetric, asymmetric information that we would take advantage of. Um, and I was just done. It's like dog years down there. You know, one year on the floor is, is like five years in other jobs. Generally, I was also married. I had two kids. I had another one on the way. I had stacked enough, you know, more chips up than I had ever dreamed of. So I was about 35, 36 years old at the time. It was November of 05, walked out of the pits at sea later, enrolled in, um, I was home for about three months. That's all I could handle. I said, okay, I got to do something. And I knew I wasn't retired. It was just sort of what's next. 
I enrolled in a master's of real estate program at DePaul University here in Chicago, got a master's over the next couple of years. Parallel to that, we started Origin Investments, my partner and I, and it was really about putting our wealth to work during that time. That's, it was a family office. We wanted to invest capital. We invested with others and we just felt like we could do it better. And if I fast forward to you, there were really a couple inflection points. We were growing the firm with our capital, with other people's capital during that point, because when you are building a firm, what you realize is that you really have to amortize costs over a much larger pool of capital. So in about 2014, 15, our team wanted to grow. We wanted to grow. We were looking going institutional. We were looking at going high net worth. And we just made a decision. We said, look, we really like working with high net worth, family offices. This is who we are. This is who we know. This is where the void is in the market. And we went all in at that time and we started marketing and advertising. And over the next two years, we went from having, you know, call it 90 investors, um, you know, that took us about seven years to get to and great LPs to about 500 over the next couple of years. And that was just raising fund three and fund three was a closed ended fund. We had no product on the shelf. So we had this marketing engine. We had an investor relations department. We were investing in technology, investing in our team. And it was really, if we fast forward to 2019, we opened up our first QZ fund. We opened up what we call our income plus fund. And these are both open-ended funds. So now we had the marketing, we had the product, we had the track record, we had, you know, everything to look for. And we had, so then it started to take off. And today, I'll just fast forward to the end. We we have 3,000 investment partners. We have four open funds that span the range from income and low risk to um, growth and, and higher risk on that side. We build, buy, and lend to multifamily. And we're focusing really on today, really a barbell approach, lending and building. Um, the middle part is just overvalued to us right now. And so the governor in, uh, in real estate is really, it comes down to replacement costs. Nuances around that we can argue, but generally, if you can build for three hundred thousand a unit versus buying for four hundred thousand a unit, you're way better off uh, buying. And so that's kind of how we look at the world from a risk return spectrum. Long winded answer, Cliff, but that's sort of oh, the background. Very of where appreciative. That's where we are today. You had a very wonderful career. You paid your dues early in your career. You did well, and you respect the investors. Uh, their funds as you put it to work intelligently. And I think that's really what it is. And then when you're looking at the amount of money, your, your personal assets that are invested right alongside those investors, that's, you know, everybody's aligned with the needs. And I think that's the key piece. Yeah, I'll just say that, it, you know, for us, there was both an advantage and a disadvantage not being from real estate. The advantage was we can look at this with a fresh eye. And we really approach the business from the investor standpoint and not being an investment manager. And so alignment from the beginning was always really, really important. And we almost considered ourselves, you know, not an outsider, but we wanted to make sure that we were aligned with our team, that our team was performance focused. And that obviously aligns with our outside partners. And that's always been a core value of origin and still is today. The disadvantage is when you're raising capital, especially when you're trying from institutions as we were early on, when you don't have that pedigree they don't really consider you, even though we brought a team in from institutions. So that's why to us, it, it just made so much more sense. These are the people who've worked really hard and we think we've got a, a great product and you know that's where we wanted to focus our efforts and we did. The family offices is a wonderful tool for our, our, our listeners to look at that institution that can go in and really provide a vibrant environment to allow that family to uh, really thrive and also you know, find the investments that they need to uh, adjustable risk and also the returns that they need to maintain their uh, standard of living at the same time. What is it specifically that drew you to real estate investing? Well, when I got out of trading, I had a pretty significant amount of wealth and the idea, it was really a couple of things, but number one, I wanted to grow and protect that wealth and build passive income. I'd already been exposed to real estate. My grandfather was in it. I saw the lifestyle that it afforded him. And it was sort of like getting back to there is what attracted me to the business. And I had invested as an LP um, in a lot of with institutions, with smaller guys. And it, it just were, was where I wanted to put the bulk of my capital. And, you know, real estate is really one of these interesting areas that's this hybrid between bonds and equities. And I didn't want to just be a passive investor, as an, a passive investor in equities. I didn't want to just put my money in bonds and earn a return. 
And, you know, that's when you have wealth, right? Inflation is, is the big thing that ultimately deteriorates that and your living expenses. So those are really the two things that, that I looked at, but it was also this realization from my partner and I that we can build something better than what we saw out there and be the best stewards of our own capital. And that is what attracted me to it. The tax efficiency, the appreciation, the growth, you know, everything else that comes with real estate as well. And then it's been, you know, many years figuring out what our strategy was, because in the beginning, it was really just two guys buying real estate. That's all we were, just buying good deals, building a firm, building a company, building infrastructure. And we were buying everything from discounted notes back then to um, student housing, industrial, uh, multifamily, you know, you name it, as long as it was a good deal. And it was a different time. When you think about buying real estate in 09, 10, you just had to buy anything, close your eyes and do it. As we've gone through, it's really operational excellence and understanding a single asset class and knowing the pennies, the nickels, the dimes. And that's why we've gravitated towards uh, multifamily as a team and an organization. And then as sort of spinoffs within multifamily. So build for rent, horizontal multifamily. We're actually talking now about getting into active adult an active adult is one of these areas that it doesn't have uh, the same operational complexities as what I'll call healthcare, um, independent living, things of that nature. So if you're drawing a Venn diagram, some people consider it part of the healthcare, some people consider it part of multifamily, but we really like that. And then focusing on a... What are your basics regarding investing? What do you see as the foundation of sound investments? Risk management, 100%. Okay. Everything that we look at, and I, and I think about risk management, it, it's all encompassing. It's everything we do. It's every decision. It's who we hire, which markets we're in, what we're not doing. Mm -hmm. It's the decisions you make on an everyday basis. And it really sound investing comes down to looking at the risk reward and covering your basis and staying. Like when we are underwriting a deal, for example, when we're in credit committee, what I tell people is anybody could be in our credit committee and understand as one of our deal officers is going through a deal and we're looking at the different variables, the growth rates and the rental rates and the cap rates and the cost to construct and the comparable properties in terms of rent and sales and things like that. And what we're always looking for is, is a few ways to win, right? And so if you're looking at rents and we're underwriting them and we can make our deal work at $1,700 per unit per month, and the comparable properties are trading $1,750, $1,800. And we're not going to get these for three years. That feels good. If we're underwriting cap rate exits at 4%, and today they're at you know three and a half or three and three quarters, mm -hmm. drifting those, that feels really good. If our sales price and we can make our numbers work at $350,000 per unit on an exit price, and the market's trading 340 to 380, and you're, okay. you're kind of looking at this, that feels good. And so these are things that when you come in here and you're looking at, at these, you have to have a, a, a level of conservatism to guard against the unknown variables that you just can't, um, you can't understand. And so what I saw go wrong, especially in 07, 08, 09, you know, during that period is we were buying real estate where people who just they were over their skis. They had business models and business plans that were pie in the sky that would never work. They were undercapitalized. They were taking too much risk on for the reward. They were guaranteeing debt. And you know that's something that as a company, we've always said we will never do is you know, my partner and I came into this organization wealthy. And the quickest way to go broke is by guaranteeing debt. So the nice thing about multifamily real estate is that there is government subsidized debt out there through the agencies, through Fannie and Freddie. And there are ways to get even on development, non-recourse um, debt on those deals. So we're very careful about what risks we're willing to take, what we're not. We don't cross collateralize assets. We do everything out of a fund. So you know, even in COVID, when this happened, we actually thought we were right back into an 08 and 09 period in COVID. And we just hoarded cash in our fund. And if you're investing in individual deals, and I'm sure your listeners will appreciate this, mm -hmm. you know that if you're in a fund and all of your deals are together, it's a company that is really the balance sheet of the company that can protect these deals. If you have 10 individual deals and one goes really bad, you can't borrow from these other companies. You're writing a check to that other deal or just giving it back to the bank. We have the ability to give things back to the bank, but the sort of the fund type investing helps us as managers. And I think it protects investors a lot too. It's a good point. Yeah. 
Can you talk about the different funds that you offer? Well, we have, I alluded to them a little bit in the beginning, but when we think about the fund, we have four funds that we operate right now. One is a well, multifamily credit fund. And this is a really unique fund in the industry. Now, this one is only for QPs, qualified purchasers. Mm-hmm. And this particular fund, what we're doing is we are buying um, K-series debt, right? K-series is debt that is um, issued by Freddie Mac. So really Freddie Mac, they're going out there and issuing loans and then they securitize these loans and we are buying the equity portion of this security. And when we look back at the 25 year history of these loans, they've never lost money. So it's one of the, the highest quality, best securitizations that you can you know, ever invest in out there. And it's a very elite group uh, that, is, that is buying these and that is invited into the rotation. You have to be in multifamily, you have to use the product, you have to have capital. And, and so there's huge barriers to entry and edge, which is why we love that particular product. And we are in the process of um, deploying that fund right now. We've got 150 million raised. That fund will be $300 million raising money through next year. And it's generating about a 9% um, yield today, right? With a target return of about 10 or 11, very low risk. The knock on that fund is it is, um, it's not tax efficient. So it's lit- when we talk about tax efficiency, but it's great for non-taxable entities. It's great for IRA accounts. Um, you know, for some who maybe have tax losses carrying forward, it's fine for them as well. Uh, our other fund, when we think about in the middle of the risk spectrum, is the Income Plus Fund. And this is an open-ended fund. It utilizes uh, both debt and ground-up development and has a core bucket of real estate. So it's a multi-strategy fund for the income-oriented investor, but also has an element of appreciation as well. It did very well in the last year, 18%. It has about a 5.6% um, distribution yield. Mm-hmm. And when we concepted this fund, it was all about creating yield with tax efficiency. And for those who don't want the yield, they can opt into the drip. So last year we generated, um, because the unit price has gone up consistently mm-hmm. over the last year. So last year at this time, the uh, the distribution yield was about 6%. And that was returned at about a 94% um, tax-free Yield so very tax efficient, and when you look at that, I mean it's almost the equivalent. When you're looking at nine percent on the taxable side versus six percent on on tax efficient, it's it's different. So, but the nice thing about that, the target return is nine to eleven, and it's open ended. You're investing all your money at once. It's not IRR driven. You're really looking to make ten percent on your money over long periods of time. And and what we've been educating our investors about over the last three four years is. Get away from IRR. You, you can't spend it. You can't eat it. You don't like think about wealth creation. And if you can make 10% on all your money, that translates into a lot of wealth creation, save on taxes, things of that nature. Because all of these things, and, and candidly, Cliff, I don't think that real estate is a good product to meld into the private equity model. Because the reason why you want to hold real estate over the long run is the tax efficiency, the depreciation, the tax benefits on that side, and also the ability to refinance um, tax-free over and over and over. And so when you put it into a true private equity model and you're buying and fixing and selling, it sounds great. You're generating these IRRs, but you're really destroying wealth by, you know, through taxes and then not taking advantage of, you know, the other elements that real estate offers. The other fund um, on the right-hand side, on the growth side, the um, this is a new one. This is called Growth Fund 4. It's a follow-up to our Growth Fund uh, 3 fund, or Fund 3 back in 2017. The difference here is this is 100% ground-up development. Mm-hmm. And the tagline is invest for growth, stay for income. So when we're talking about um, building these funds for tax efficiency, one thing we've heard from our investors and from us too is, is look, awesome. We did that great deal. Why did we sell? And then you're like, well, it's just part of the fund strategy. And we were kind of following the model. The reality is that once people take the risk, they want to stay into the deal. They want to enjoy those benefits. And so what we've done is we've transferred that decision-making to the investor. And after four years, the fund just resets. It becomes more of a core fund. You can stay in, you can get out, you can enjoy the cash flow. And those are the kinds of things that we're really thinking about, innovative structures that produce more wealth over time and are just smarter investment structures. Last fund we have is our QZ fund. And our QZ2 fund really mm-hmm. takes advantage of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. And that is a tax advantage fund. It's for 
wealthy individuals who are taxable, who have capital gains put to work. And I'm not going to bore you with the details, but what I tell all of our investors when they're asking me like where I should put the money, I say, look, if you have capital gains, there is no better place than a QOZ fund. There's no such thing as a free lunch. But when you have a government program that is, is just giving you money, you have to take advantage of it or at least explore it. It's worth your time. And I think, you know, that to me is where I'm pushing a lot of my own personal wealth is into the QOZ fund because the long and short of it is if you're in there for 10 years, then none of your gains are taxable. And it's one of the best programs for investors. And it looks like they're going to extend this program another couple of years. So we're excited about you know, our suite of products and especially the uh, the QOZ fund as well. That's interesting because we're bringing up the next gen. A lot of our listeners are very interested in how to provide a foundational education to their children. And what does the next generation wealth look like? You know, there's going to be a tremendous amount of transfer and they're looking at, do you, you may have it with your co-founder at this point, the patience to work with the next gen to bring them in, you know, dad, provides a check, say it's $10 million, and you'll help them deploy it between your funds and look at the tax efficiencies that are available. And the funds really, we're really funding the next generation. And you're looking at this strategically and it will work in the benefit of the family. Plus that young person, the next generation has an opportunity to get educated by very, very bright individuals, you know, yourself and your associate and co-founder. And I think that's a very rich environment to be at. So, you know, I recommend that to my listeners to reach out, ask them intelligent questions. And I think it's important to bring our children into these conversations early. You know, it's, we actually, Cliff, you bring up a good point. We, uh, we have a lot of family office clients and we work with the children all the time. And some of the children are, are much older. They're very bright. They're investment savvy, bringing them in, teaching them about this. And I would say that a large portion, um, probably more than 50% of our investors, um, our investment partners, they're investing for the next generation. Very so good. things like compounding wealth and, and generating and making it simple and easy and tax efficient, those um, conversations really resonate with them. And, and candidly, it resonates with us too. And David and I, when we're thinking about building funds, we're the litmus test. What do we want? What are the mistakes have we done in the past? And when we look at fund two and fund three and fund one, candidly, I wish we never sold any of those assets. And, and it's easy to be armchair quarterback, right? And, and But when you look at investing for the long term, and that's what we're doing, I will guarantee you that in 10 years, multifamily real estate will be higher than it is today. And replacement costs will be higher than it is today. There's never been a time in the history of the United States where institutional multifamily real estate has lost money. And we're talking about some of the worst periods, the 1970s and 80s, and even through the great financial um, recession, mm -hmm. within four years, you were sort of back at the same price as you were in 07. It's a good message to our listeners. You believe that calculated risk-taking in an inefficient markets is the key to building wealth. Can you speak to that? Yeah, this really comes back from my trading days and looking, where do you find edge in the market and how do you take advantage of asymmetric information? And when we look at, at real estate, I mentioned K-series for one. Um, I don't, the nuances, we, anybody who wants to learn more about this, we can share with you. There is a huge edge in that particular business when you're dealing directly with Freddie, and there's very few players. So we love that business quite a lot. Um, real estate is all about relationships, and you're not dealing with public securities, perfect information. You are negotiating private transactions on the ground. So when we're negotiating a preferred equity um, opportunity, with the developer, with a deal, we might be in negotiating that with you know two or three other people who are competing. That sure beats if there were full transparency and you have 500 people who are competing for that deal and what that would drive. So that is a really important element to generate alpha, to generate high risk adjusted returns. And it's interesting because even on the preferred equity side, in theory, as the market has adjusted and you've seen the 10-year come up, we've had a lot of investors who've asked us, hey, are you are you pricing the, are you repricing this? And I'm like, no, we're not. We're getting 13% on you know, assets that we loaned 80 to 85% to cost. And by the way, now the project is built and we're at 60% of value and we're still getting 13%. If anything, we should be writing these up because we're occupying a bank position that will loan at four and a half percent 
and we're at 13. So, you know, these are the kinds of arbitrage opportunities that we're looking for. And then if you go to the, uh, the development side, it's about understanding where demand is happening. It's about buying land. It's about getting entitlements. It's about creating value from the ground up. Um, meeting the market, building the right project, and just protecting capital at all times. So even in the world of real estate, our typical developments are $50 million on the small side to $100 million on the big side. If you're buying existing real estate, I will tell you that you are those kinds of deals, they don't fall off the apple cart, right? They're, it's really hard to get edge or opportunity. The edge happens to come generally in your operational expertise. So you might have an edge in operations and value add in improvement, and you can you can quantify that through the track record. But where we like to play right now is in that barbell, in the preferred equity, in the debt side, and then also the ground up development. And that's where we just think we we add a lot of value and alpha to our funds, and a big reason for why we've generated the returns we have. Steady returns that are consistent with a great team. It's a win for them, you know, for our listeners. How can you make real estate investments tax efficient? Well, by itself, it is tax efficient. So when we think about multifamily, we're getting the benefit of depreciation, you know, first and foremost. So your cash flow is, is shielded. The QOZ fund is very good. Uh, it, it doesn't, honestly, it doesn't get more tax efficient than that. And the interesting thing about QOZ law is that they actually allow depreciation and accelerated depreciation into the program with no recapture. So for those of you who may not be um, familiar with the accounting, generally what happens is accelerated depreciation sounds like a great tool, but if you sell the asset in three or four or five years, you're recapturing that. And anything that you've done above straight line depreciation is taxed at ordinary income. So you're not really, the bonus depreciation, I, I think is largely misunderstood. And then even in depreciation, you have what's called a recapture tax, but it's at a more favorable rate than what you're getting the benefit for. So QZ, um, incredibly tax efficient. And then when you own real estate for the long term, you can refinance over and over and over tax-free. And we have investors, family offices who invest with us, and it's great. I love talking to them and hearing about properties they bought in the 1980s for a million dollars, and now it's worth 40, 50, 60 million dollars. And like, Michael, I've refinanced, you know, $35 million. We've made 50 million in cash flow on this. And you just you don't sell good real estate. Not every property is going to work like that. But it's no different than stocks. If you have a great portfolio of real estate, you're going to have outliers in there. And candidly, Cliff, from my trading background, what I love about real estate is that it is illiquid. And people talk about a liquidity premium. But you know, in my world, if I see a stock going up, I'm just not a good stock investor. So I build illiquidity into my life because I know what my... I just know what my limitations are as an individual. And if I see a stock go up, I'm usually like sell, sell, sell. So it's great to have a long-term illiquid strategy that has cash flow and appreciation combined in there. It does take the emotional aspect out of it. It's for the long-term. Are there any recession-proof real estate investments? I'm going to answer that. Into, it depends on how big the recession is. And we've had this question. We get questions from um, investors. We hold mm -hmm. open forums quite a bit in Q and A's. And I had an investor ask me, well, what, Michael, what happens if uh, interest rates go to 9%? I said, I hope you got gold in your portfolio, really. Because if, if interest rates go to 9%, we have a lot of problems in this country and it goes way beyond real estate. And I think any model needs to be able to withstand a two standard deviation move, a three standard deviation move. But when you start talking about five standard deviation moves. I'm like, look, we're going to be negotiating with the banks. We're going to be doing things. You really like before you are in a recession and when we were in COVID at that time, we went out on a webinar to all of our investors. And I remember this, we talked to our marketing department and they said, well, what are you going to say? And I'm going to, I said, well, what we're going to say is we don't know what's going on, but we've made some really good decisions up until this point. And our money is with your money and we're going to fight like hell, to the nail to do what we can to maximize value here. So it's all those decisions. And I'll tell you, again, going back to being a student of the game, when you look at 07, 08, and 09, the ones, the funds and the investment managers who really failed, they had a lax risk management policy. They cross-collateralized assets. And I'll never forget talking to this one investor who told me that he had a 100% loss in a debt fund. 
And he did all everything right, going into debt, protecting his money. But what he didn't know is that the manager in this debt fund was cross-collateralizing everything. So it became a house of cards. He didn't know that. And most people wouldn't. And so you have to, um, you know, there, is there anything recession proof? No tree goes to the sky. There's no such thing, you know, real estate that won't go down. But you have to look at things in the lens of, okay, if this happened, what happens then? And use some just your gut, right? Because ultimately you're investing with people and if they have your money with you and how are you protected? And for us, we've been in a very defensive position even pre-COVID. What we saw was this imbalance in the market where you had replacement costs of existing or existing assets trading well above replacement costs. Every one of our funds is defensively positioned today. And I will say even with our, uh, with our growth fund for ground up development, our whole rationale there is what I said before, which is if you can build for $300,000 a unit and market is trading for $400,000, you're way off, better off building. Now, is there risk? Yes, but this is what we do. We, we are the ones who help mitigate that risk and the execution risk on that side. Then the other side, which is preferred equity, I'm very comfortable that in any recession right now, especially with the housing shortage that we have going on. Right. Yeah, I see the permitting is one of the challenges at this point. I see, you see raw materials. I think some of that coming down at this point, you see in your construction costs are getting reduced a little bit. A little bit. It's not yeah. as much as you think though, because labor is sticky. And, and the other thing is everybody's so busy out there. So when we think about a housing shortage and what we're up against, this is actually a reverberation from 2008 because spec housing left the market. They haven't built enough for the millennials on top of that. You've got mortgage rates now that are at 6%. So that's leading to more demand in, on the multifamily side. Okay. And it doesn't correct itself overnight. So we're, we're going to be in a little bit of a, you know, what I'll call an yes. imbalance here for the next mm -hmm. few years, because it does take the market a while. It takes a while for labor to come back to the market. It takes a while for organizations like ours to find a property, to permit a property, to build a property, to rent the property. So this is going to be something that is solved over, I would say, the next two, three, four years, but certainly not overnight. So there's a lot of um, runway left I would, even on the for sale side and on the multifamily side. Hopefully the government will get out of the way and let the entrepreneurs build a phenomenal you know, economy. We'll see. They have so far. Yeah. Is there anything I haven't touched on that you would like to add, Mike? I don't think so, Cliff. You've asked some really good questions. Uh, I was I was thinking about this. A lot of times I get asked, well, what's a good book? And I just read, uh, you know, kind of a foundational book. It's called The Psychology of Money. And somebody in our investor relations department gave it to me. And I found it such an interesting read. It's got 20-something chapters. They're, uh, they're really short. I gave it to my kids. But it's just this reminder that investing is more about behavior then it is about what you know. And that's really what it comes down to is how we behave, how an investor behaves, whether it's stock, real estate, and that, those are, you know, what I'll, I'll call the uh, the abridged version. It's, it, that's what investing is about. But I thought it was a great book that I would recommend to anybody. And I, you know, I plan on reading it again. No, I appreciate good lessons that. that you can learn. Thank you, Mike. Yeah. How can our listeners contact you? Are there any links you would like to share? Yeah, anybody can email me directly. We always uh, pride ourselves on having a direct relationship with our investment partners. We have more than 3,000 today. We do have an investor relations department set up to handle inquiries. My email is michael at origininvestments.com. Or if you want, we make it very easy for people to interact with us. Go to our website, origininvestments.com. You can download any of our fund material. You can do due diligence. You can reach out to somebody in investor relations there. You know, a lot of ways to get in touch with it and try to make it very easy for the user. I want to thank you so much for your time, Michael. Your sound advice on real estate investing is something anyone listening can benefit from. Thank you for sharing that vision. Thank you to our listeners. I look forward to being back with you shortly for another episode of the Private Equity Profits Podcast. This show has been produced by Market Domination, LLC.